Hello and welcome to Grace Church's Sunday online service. It's great that you can join us today. You're really welcome. Um, if you would like to find out more about Grace Church, then please email us at hey at gracechurch.se. Uh, later today, some of us are going to be going to Ulrich Stahl's slot. Um, we're going to hang out together and also hopefully see Joe, who will be passing through while he's doing his 80 kilometer eco trail. So if you want to come and hang out with some friends from Grace Church, then we'd love to see you. So that will be 2.30 at Ulrich Dahl's slot outside the cafe. Bring a picnic blanket, bring a football, um, come and have fun. We'll space out depending how many we are so that we can do it in a safe way. Uh, this morning, Phil is going to be speaking to us about the spirit fills and James is going to be leading us in worship. So let's have a great time together and maybe see some of you later. Bye. Hello, it's me again. I forgot to say one thing um, in the welcome video. I wanted just to encourage you to be watching the videos that Phil's been posting in the Grace Church devotional group. Um, I found them really helpful um, and really encouraging. One of my favourite ones was last week where um, there was a guy who was talking about God's love and how God sees us and it's not always how I would necessarily see myself and he spoke from a verse from Song of Solomon's um, that says he thinks my face is lovely and my voice is sweet um, and that that's what God thinks about us. So keep that in mind as you come to him this morning um, as we worship God and as we hear his word that as we come to him God's delighted because he thinks that our faces are lovely and our voice is sweet. So I'd really encourage you to watch the videos that Phil's been posting. They're really helpful I think. Um, that's it from me this time. Bye. I think Jesus is amazing because he gives us such a good example of how to love other people and how to care for other people. Um, and we see in Philippians 2, even though he was God, he came down and he made us not even um, equal with us, but he made himself lower and was so servant hearted. He forgives us and carries on loving us even when we mess up. And I think that's just so wonderful. Aoife, who is Jesus? The most amazing person on I have ever heard of. Why is he so amazing, do you think? Because he died on the cross for us, um, even though we didn't deserve it. And to save us from Satan. And he loves, that's how much Jesus loves us. That's superb, yeah, it's true. Hello, I'm Dan. Uh, and I think the thing that's really blown me away over the last uh, year or so about Jesus is re-realising just how much Jesus loves me and how passionately he loves me and how desperately he loves me and how fully he loves me and that he's not like an, an irritated parent. He's not disappointed in me. He is full of love and compassion and mercy and grace and patience with me. And he longs for me to come to him no matter what. I think there's two things that have really leapt out of me in uh, realising this. One of them is in Song of Songs. Uh, it's chapter two uh, and it's verse 14. The verse says this, my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. And I think I've always read that thinking that's how we should feel about Jesus. And I agree that's how I should feel about Jesus. His voice is sweet and his face is lovely. And yet actually in Song of Songs, that's that's the groom speaking to the bride. And if you take Song of Songs as a picture of Jesus marrying the church, his bride, this is Jesus speaking to me. He longs to see my face and he longs uh, to hear my voice no matter what. There's not a situation where Jesus doesn't want to hear from me. And I think I've been really struck by how much I need to realise that. I think I've always known why Jesus had to die on the cross. But I've never really before thought about why Jesus wanted to die on the cross because he loves me and the beautiful outcome of that uh, comes later in one of the gospels where Jesus says whoever comes to me I will in no wise cast out I will in no way turn them away and I can always think of a million excuses and reasons why Jesus should reject me and turn me away I know what's going on inside me I know how dirty I am and yet Jesus says whoever comes to me I will in no way cast out so I can come up with all the excuses in the world Jesus wants me to go to him. Jesus wants me to talk to him. Jesus wants me to spend time with him. Jesus loves hearing from me because to him, whether I believe it or not, my face is lovely and my voice is sweet. 
And I think I've been really excited and motivated and thrilled by just how much Jesus loves me. Um, more than I ever really realised. And I've always sung this song since I was a child. Maybe you know it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And the truth is I didn't believe it very much. So I've been really thrilled by just learning to believe again afresh just how much Jesus really loves me. Hey guys, um, just a quick video um, to introduce myself. My name is Carb Um and I am South African. So I came to Sweden about <clears throat> five years ago. This is the fifth year now. So, and actually I, I got a job offer here. And yeah, it's been going well ever since. Been, I'm still at the same school, so that's that's pretty good. Uh, I'm a science teacher, and I love what I'm doing. Um, yeah, and so Sweden, Stockholm now is our permanent home, which is which is pretty cool. I'm here with my my wife, and we've in the last two years we've had a son. Uh, so our little family is very settled here in Stockholm. Um, and it's been an amazing main, amazing journey so far. Um, I have also, we've bought a place, we live in Kalhau, so that's a little bit further out, but uh, we love it, there's a lot of activities, a lot of nature for our son, um, so it was strange how I actually got the job, uh, my mother saw a newspaper article um, talking about needing teachers in, in Sweden and they advertised posts. Um, she cut it out and she stuck it on the fridge and she said, no, you must apply. And I was really hesitant. I said, no, no, you know, I'm happy where I am te currently teaching at the school I was at, private school. Loved it. Um, very involved. Uh, and eventually, my mom convinced me just to apply. And, and I did. And then fast forward, I got interviews and fast forward even further in about six to eight months, I spoke to my wife and we packed up everything, sold everything, and we moved the long journey to Stockholm from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, so that was a long journey. Uh, and when we arrived, it's obviously an amazing feeling. We didn't have the intention of staying for longer than two years. My wife always thought it was just gonna be a year and get the experience and go back. But um, yeah, as I said, five years later, we're still here. And enjoying and loving life here actually um, don't see us going back anytime soon um, I actually have been part of Grace Church um, I, I think since 2019 um, when I, I came back from the hospital I, I have a brain tumor so um, a lot of treatment through that um, and I heard about I was looking for a church after I came out of the hospital and spoke to Lydia Eskadom and she mentioned that this church was available and quite quite accommodating and she loved the people so uh, she invited me and yeah since we came there in 2019 uh, we really enjoyed it as well unfortunately the pandemic hit as well <laughs> but we, we really enjoyed the people and speaking to everybody and getting to know uh, Grace Church and the community that Grace Church has obviously Obviously, is it's a wonderful community of people, uh, international community, I would say, from all over the world. So that that was really easy for us to feel welcomed and accepted in in this new environment uh, because it's similar to what I'm used to. Um, so yeah, uh, other than that, I I don't have any many hidden talents. I mean, I I used to play cricket quite recently until I actually moved to to Stockholm. I used to enjoy it, football. Rugby, um, any sport really. I, I used to enjoy playing. I, I struggle to play a little bit now, but hopefully, in the next couple of months, uh, the, the stronger I get, the more confident I'll, I'll be to participate again, maybe in cricket or or something that I really love. Um, I do like gaming as well. Um, I'm an avid gamer. Uh, I enjoy mostly story driven games single player campaigns but uh, obviously FIFA is something that I enjoy playing um, I've got a large collection of games different consoles I used to be more into collecting games now with my son I don't collect that many anymore I still have a decent amount of games um, yeah so that's something that you might not know about me um, I, I enjoy art uh, 
I used to do art quite quite a bit when I was a little bit younger, paint pictures, um, design things, um, and it goes hand in hand with being a, a teacher. I used to do a lot of my own drawings and and illustrations of things, so that helped. Um, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing our family this holiday. Um, yeah, other than that, I don't think there's any more hidden talents unless I, I hide them so well. I, I don't even remember them myself. <laughs> but it's been wonderful chatting to you, and I wish you a blessed day. And if you have any any questions for me or you want to get a hold of me, um, please just contact us on the Grace Church website. And, yeah, I would love to, to meet new people and introduce my wife and my son. Um, yeah, have a wonderful day. Bye. Well, good morning, Grace Church. I uh, hope you're enjoying this this wonderful summer weather we're having. Um, all my Swedish friends tell me that Sweden has the best summers in the world. Um, and the, the, the rains of May and the, the fog and darkness of November is, is now forgotten, forgiven. Um, so it's great to, to enjoy some sunny weather, isn't it? Um, we also uh, we have a, an amazing privilege that we can worship God, uh, that he wants us to worship him. Uh, in Hebrews it talks about we have a way open to us through the death of Christ. Um, I'd like to sing a couple of songs to start with um, that really pick up on this. first one's really a prayer. Uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. A prayer that we'll see God, that we'll see him high and lifted up. Uh, and then the second one uh, really just talks about how we have this amazing privilege. Um, it's also one of my favourite songs. Um, it's called Boldly I Approach the Throne, uh, but there's a, a bridge talk about the, the art of celebration, knowing we're free from condemnation. And it has a real joy, uh, a real joy that, that can only come from knowing him. Uh, so we'll, we'll sing that one first, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, and then go straight into uh, Boldly I Approach.
thank you that we can see you, Lord. We thank you that we can have a way to you. We thank you, Lord, that you can open our hearts. And we pray that you'll open that this morning. That we'll see you clearly, Lord. That we'll know who you are. That our worship will be pleasing to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen.
Definitely one of the ones I'm really looking forward to singing in person with everybody. Uh, definitely needs a few few hands in the air for that one. Uh, we're just going to sing one final song in closing. Uh, we're going to sing Behold Our God. Um, if we've gone through worship and God has answered our prayer, we see him. We see something of his character maybe that we've not seen before. We see an aspect of him that perhaps we've forgotten, that we've become comfortable with we've become accustomed to. So I really hope we see God a little bit more clearly this morning. It's a great song, this one. Uh, each verse poses a series of questions and the answer is the same uh, to all those questions in each verse. So in verse one, the answer to all the questions is God, who has held the oceans in his hand. In verse two, the answer is nobody who has given counsel to the Lord, who can question any of his words. And in verse 3, the answer is Jesus, who has felt the nails upon his hands, who has borne the guilt of sinful man. We'll sing this together. Behold our God.
you have a very blessed day. God bless. Good morning, church. Should we close our eyes in prayer? Father God, we thank you for the message that we have received or will receive today and we pray that it will bring a revelation in our hearts. Father God, we pray for your hand upon our lives and that those around us would be touched by you. We pray, Father God, for your gentleness and kindness that it would work in and through us, Father God, to those around us and that you would just touch those, Father God, that we come into contact with this week and that your Holy Spirit would just work in and through us, Father God. Father God, we pray for those that are lonely in this time. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring them peace and comfort. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would protect their minds, Father God, in this time, and just protect their minds from any suffering. We pray the blood of Jesus, Father God, for any of those that are struggling with mental health right now, that feel isolated, Lord Jesus, and that you would be with them, Father God. We pray that we would break off the chains of depression, Lord Jesus, that you would break off any chains of anxiety or fear, Father God, for those that are suffering in this time. Lord, we pray for all our healthcare workers. We pray that you would give them supernatural wisdom as they make decisions, Father God, and they continue to fight COVID-19. We pray, Lord Jesus, for a supernatural amount of strength, Father God, and that you would just speak to them, Lord, as they are dealing with their patients day in and day out. Father God, we pray for absolute healing for any of your children that are suffering um, with this disease or, or any other disease, Father God. And we pray for miracles, Lord Jesus, that you would just heal them from the tip of their head to the to the bottom of their toes and we pray father god for those who don't believe that we would continue to pray for them for healing for them father god and that it would be a testimony to your goodness father god to your amazing power um, and the hand that you have over their life and the love that you have for them lord jesus father god we thank you for your presence we thank you that you're pure, that you're holy, and that you're almighty. And we pray, Father God, that we don't forget that, that it doesn't become normal to us, Father God, but rather just build within us a reverence um, for your omnipresence, for your all-knowing all nature, Lord Jesus. We pray that in this week that we, we would turn our eyes towards you, Lord Jesus, and we pray, Lord, that your face would shine upon us. We pray for a deep supernatural joy. It says in the Bible that um, that our joy comes from you, Father God, and that it's our strength. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that daily um, you fill us with your joy and with your strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, church. This is Alex and Mimi. We're going to read the Bible to you. So today we're reading from Ephesians 5. And we start at 1 and then go to 21. So you can start, Alex. All right. Starting in verse 1, it says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly beloved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you, there must be not even a hint of sexual immorality, or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper of God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenities, foolish talk, or coarse jokes, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such as a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, 
for the, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention that the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Good morning and welcome. My name is Phil and it's my privilege to speak with you uh, this morning. We're looking at a series of the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How does God help us? What are the different ways and interactions that we have with the Spirit of God in our everyday life? And today we're looking at this, uh, the topic of the Spirit fills. What do you do if your car needs petrol or diesel? Or if to update my illustration, the battery needs charging? I guess the same could be said for your phone. What do you do if you want to make a cup of tea or coffee and the kettle is empty? What do you do if you realise you're getting a bit hangry and your body needs some energy? And if you looked at your bank account towards the, before the 25th of the month, what would you realise? In each case, there is something that is empty that needs filling. A car with petrol, a battery with electricity, a kettle with water, a body with food and a bank account with money. And in each case, you would know which fuel source fits which vessel. You all know that your car won't go very far when you try and fill it with sandwiches. You don't put water into your bank account, you don't put petrol into your kettle or into your phone. I guess you could plug yourself in, but food would work better. You can tell when something is empty doesn't work, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Um, and you know what to refill it with. You know where to get the refill from, and you can tell when it is full again. There is money in your account, there is food in your stomach, there is power in your phone, or fuel in your car, the kettle boils. Yet many Christians can't tell when they are spiritually empty and they don't know how to get full and they can't tell if they are. Something is wrong. Paul's pattern in his letter to the Ephesians, which we're looking at this morning, is helpful. He uses the first half of the letter to explain gospel truths. What has God done? What does it mean? How God in his kindness has saved us, redeemed us, transformed, transferred us from death to life, darkness to light, isolation to adoption. The second half of the letter is gospel application. What does it mean to put these things into practice in your church, in your family, in your work, in your marriage? How does it change how you talk, how you work, how you love, how you live? What are the things to avoid and what are the things to practice? And this is important because if, if all you have is just application um, without, without gospel truth, then you end up in a, in a, in a, eventually in a rules-based religion. You're trying to pull yourself up uh, by your bootstraps, as we would say. And if you don't know what to do with the truths, you end up with, if you've just got truth and you've got no application, then perversely you can end up with untransformed lives. Transformation happens when truth puts its boots on and goes for a walk throughout your life. Transformation happens when truth puts its boots on and walks, works it out throughout your life. So we need to remember both these things. We need to remember the gospel truths and we need to think through the gospel applications. 
We need to know and remember and be clear about our identity in Christ when we figure out what does that mean and shape how we live, which is what we see in Ephesians chapter 5, which is our reading today. Let's have a look at the first two verses just as an example. Therefore, be imitators of God, it says in verse 1, as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Now you've got gospel truth and identity. Christ loved us, gave himself up for us, it was a sacrificial offering to God. As a result, we are beloved children. God has done something, it has changed who we are, therefore what do we do? We should walk in love and be imitators of God. Paul presses into the gospel application in the very next verse. Sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you. And there's not even a hint of it as is proper among the saints. Not even a hint. Gospel application. Your new identity has consequences. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk, crude joking, sexual immorality or impurity, no coveting, which is you know, really wanting something so much that actually it becomes a god to you. This isn't a complete list, but it was probably relevant to the Ephesian church. But we can easily apply those same things today. What are the things that you say, look at, think about, that you know doesn't honour Jesus? You're not living out your identity. You're, in fact, you have an identity crisis a little bit. Paul's teaching is simple. Don't do that. That's not who you are. So Paul says in verse 15 of chapter 5, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. As a parent, uh, when your child has learned how to walk, um, you teach them how to walk beside a road. It's not just that they know they can sort of bumble along without falling over. There's a certain way of walking when you're, when you're walking beside a road. Uh, how to cross the road. Don't mess around here. You know, it's, they, there are cars coming by. You have to stay in this part. You, you, you teach a child not just how to walk, but how to walk here. But when you get to the park, you let go of their hand and say, go run, go enjoy yourself. You want them to enjoy the freedom of the safe, wide open spaces. This is good. Go have fun, enjoy it. Learning how to walk as the wise is not so complicated. When I'm by a busy road, I need to walk one way. When I'm in the safe open spaces of the goodness of God, I need to walk another way. I can walk another way. But there's a key in all of this that makes all the difference. It makes all the difference to how we go about and think about our life. And that is the Holy Spirit. Because Paul says in verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Be full, not empty. Be empowered, not weak. Be charged up, not powerless. Be in an ongoing state of fullness. Be full. Like you would check your phone. You Probably when you leave the house, you've got this unconscious habit of just checking your phone to see if it's charged up. Probably overnight you will plug your phone in or something so that in the morning when you take it out with you, it's charged and ready to go. In one sense, if you can do that with your phone, you should do that with your soul. Am I charged up? Am I ready to go? Have I, have I connected to my source of power? Am I full, essentially, with the Holy Spirit? And you need to know... What does it mean? How do I go about going from a state of emptiness to a state of fullness? And how can I tell when I am full? So let's just dip into the truth of the, quickly into the truth of the first half of Ephesians that help us work this out. Because be filled is Paul's practical advice. When Paul says dealing with something, he says be filled. This is, this is what you should be. And this isn't just a state, it's clearly not a state that just applies to we're all Christians, we've all got the 
Holy Spirit, we're all in a, in a, in a place of fullness automatically. Now, I know that's not what Paul is saying, and it doesn't fit with the language that he's used, which is an imperative. He's saying, go be filled, and be filled always. Um, so Paul's practical advice is be filled, and I think he would have assumed that you would have known what to do in the same way if I had said, could you fill this up with water, please? And you'd have gone to the tap, turned it on, filled it up with water, known when it was full, and you'd be ready to go. I think Paul has the same mentality thinking here. But I think, I'm not sure that everyone today is as nearly as clear as Paul assumes his, reader, his readers were. So, in Ephesians 1.13, this is what it says. It says, you also, right into the Ephesians, the church, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is, if you're a Christian, if you trust in Jesus, you heard what Jesus has done for you. You heard how he died for you on the cross. You heard how he gave up his life to take on his one who knew no sin, to take on your sins, to redeem you and to ransom you from your sins so that you could go from a state of darkness into a state of light, from a state of death under the sentence of death to, to eternal life. Or you could go from being isolation to be adopted children of God, all because for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You heard what Jesus had did and you believed in Jesus. And then it says this in verse 13, you were sealed with the, Holy, with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So it's as if God has put a deposit down. There's a day when you're going to buy the house, but you've put a deposit down now. The house is yours, but you don't fully own it yet. There's something coming. You've got a great inheritance awaiting for you, but you're not there yet. But you've got the deposit. God, when you said yes to God, God said yes to you, did this exchange and put the deposit in. He said, sealed, done, that's mine now. He stamped you with a seal, with the Holy Spirit. It imprints on your soul and it, an instantly recognisable symbol of ownership that points and shows to you and to everyone else who you belong to and in whose image likeness you bear this has got the stamp a divine heavenly stamp it's sealed with the holy spirit and how do i know when we go through the valleys when we go through the tough times how do we go when we go through the struggles when we go through the moments where your your world is rocked by something or when you're just uh, in feeling like you're in a wilderness or a desert where life is just a grind and, a, and hard. How do we know that God will be good to his word? How do we know 2,000 years separated from, uh, from the time of Jesus that God will have come back, where God will restore the world, that God will resurrect us from the dead, that there will be a, a new heavens and a new earth, that all his, all his promises will come true? How do we know? because we've got a guarantee, because we have the Spirit. Which is exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 3, verse 16 to 20. He says this, he says, according to the riches of Paul prays, he says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Do you have power in your inner being? If you do, if you need it, it comes from, if you, if you haven't and you need it, it comes from the Holy Spirit. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts, so Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work in us, what's that power at work in us? It's the Holy Spirit. 
to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. The Spirit will work on you from the inside out to know Christ and his love and, and so that you may be filled with the fullness. I mean, it's Paul is like, it's like, it's like God is full of love and Paul is saying, be filled, be full of his love. Like be really, really full like God. Be overflowing with it. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you find you're getting short and snappy, you're, you're tired, I'm probably. If grumbling comes out, tired, you know, if moaning comes out, if crudeness comes out, if, if when you're shaken, fear comes out. There's all sorts of things that can come out of us when, we're, when we spill. And they can be indications of what is really going on in our hearts. Be overflowing with what God overflows with, which is love. Go back to the well if you recognise that you are thirsty, if you are dry. Go back, come to me, all you are thirsty. Streams of living water will flow from you. These are the promises of Jesus to us. So all of this is what we see when, it, when truth puts its boots on in chapter 5. Overflow. And how do we know when we are full? What is, what, Paul doesn't give us. Um, there are sp- spiritual gifts which can overflow out of us. Uh, speaking in tongues, that's an overflow of our heart to God or a groan towards God. Something I practice um, and believe in. But, but Paul gives us a different list here and you don't have to... Um, and I think these are quite helpful, and they're actually they're they're um, you know they're 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 a little bit more perhaps everyday recognisable. So what is the overflow aspects that Paul uh, anticipates here? First, singing, singing songs of worship. Sometimes in a worship, uh, sometimes in a church, the worship is flat because the gu- guitar is out of tune, and so is everybody else. But the bigger problem. In, in, sometimes in churches is not tunelessness but emptiness lack lust of worship which stops after one song and no one's you know there's no energy there's nothing there's there suggests suggests emptiness fullness looks like a people who overflow with as paul says songs hymns psalms singing hearts full of melody overflow looks like worship when your love in your heart wants to come out in praise to god Worship is what it looks like. Paul describes a worshipping church. Same in Colossians. Paul's expectation throughout his churches is that there would be joy. And this joy would express itself as humans have always expressed itself in every culture, in every time, in every place, through song. I haven't looked at it, but I'd be really surprised if we found that there wasn't a singing culture, if there was a culture where there was no singing. A silent culture that had no songs, that had no praise, that had nothing like that. Well, Paul describes here a church which is overflowing with song. Praises to God. The ah, the overflow, the goodness, the joy, the wonder, the amazement, the capture of it. What can my heart do with it? It just wants to sing to God. This is... Paul says, overflow of being filled with the Spirit. Because worship is what hearts full of love do. Worship is what hearts full of love do. The second mark of the Spirit of overflow here that Paul says is thankfulness. Always and for everything. The Spirit is better than your morning cup of joe. It blows away the grumbling, the groaning, the weariness always and for everything. You start seeing the goodness of God all over the place and in so many ways. And thankfulness leads to deeper joy and appreciation and increased worship. And I'm sure that if you did the studies, your life satisfaction will go up. The people who say thank you more often are happier people, more contented people, people who are grateful and, you know, kind of have gratitude deep within them are likely to to, to experience the benefits in so many other relational ways. But here we go, here we see it. Then when you start seeing the goodness of God, gratitude flows up. So 
be grateful, start your day with thanks and prayer. And, and, and in Ephesians 6, Paul talks about the, the armor of God and the, what the role of the Spirit, which is the, the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God and prayer. So we, have, we open our Bibles, we read our scriptures, we see the goodness and the truth of God, we pray them into, into, you know, into our hearts, not just pray the shopping list, pray out thanks and recognition of what God has done and who God is. We remember your deeds, O God. We remember your ways. We remember who you are. We remember our slavery and our liberation. That's where we start in prayer before we get to help me with my work today. And the final thing that Paul mentions is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. As I have said time and time again, the two great things that we need to focus on in our lives is to love God with all of our hearts, worship, thankfulness, love God with all of your heart, mind, soul and strength. Do that. Secondly, focus on that. Make sure that in your life, in the rhythm of your life, there is a space for loving God with all of your heart. Out upward, we look up. There is also a space for looking in. Uh, for, you know, letting gratitude change me from the inside out. And there's looking out, looking to others. Loving the family of God, the people of God, and then loving those outside of the, the church, loving, loving the lost. So we love people, we love God, and we love people. And the Spirit produces love in your heart for God's people, to serve them and to help them, and to love all of God's children, and to seek to bring the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who don't know, and to bring them in. One of the overflows of love out of the work of the Spirit is that we are empowered. The Spirit sends us um, the Spirit empowers us to tell others. And so if you find that your evangelism is, uh, if your desire to tell, the lot, to tell people about Jesus is weak, and if you feel like it's ineffective, and you feel like your heart is dry, and you feel like your worship is flat, and you feel like you're, you know, all of these things, the answer to all of them is one and the same. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Because together, Paul says in chapter 2 of Ephesians, we are being built together, together as a church, we're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, a holy temple in the Lord. So how do we, how do we know, so we, these are some markers, how do I know that I'm being full of the Spirit? Well, I want to worship. How do I know that the Spirit is filling me up? Because, oh, I... I want to pray, I want to thank him. I've got so many things to say thank you to God. And once I start counting my blessings, they flow and they flow and they flow. Um, oh, how do I know that the spirits are working me? I feel prompted to serve and I'm not just thinking about, my, about myself and my day and my gender. I'm, I'm happy and willing and looking for opportunities to serve. I'm putting myself in places where I can be involved and be, on that, be where the action is. I'm looking for all of those things. I'm putting myself in a place where God can use me. I'm, I'm wanting to move out from being self-centered to other-centered, being shifted upward, inward, and outward. I'm seeing the changes. That, th these are some of the overflows. These are some of the markers to tell. But how, do I, how does it happen in the first place? Well, Jesus said, ask. He, he said, ask. If, if uh, He said, you... You useless fathers, if your child asks for bread and you know how to give it to him, you give bread instead of a scorpion or a stone, how much more will, the, will our, your Father in heaven not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So it's as simple as that. It's ask. One way of, um, of, of helping one another is if you're praying with others, is to is to ask them to pray for you, to pray with you, to pray with you in the asking, to kind of come alongside, to lay on hands and pray for, the, for a filling, a refilling of the Holy Spirit, which is not a, it's not a, this is not a charismatic thing, this is a Christian thing. This is, this is what it means to be Christian, life in the fullness of the Spirit. Paul is describing something here that is standard for everyone, everywhere, 
all the time. Be filled with the Spirit. Live this life because that is who you are. So brothers and sisters, if you're, if, you're, if you're dry, ask. Ask and the Spirit will come. Let it overflow in worship and in thankfulness and in service. And love God and love people. And as we do that, we will find the help and the strength and the power that we need. The Spirit fills. <laughs>